Hi, it's James Governor, co-founder of Red Monk. We're here for another Red Monk conversation. Uh, super happy today to have Matthew O'Reardon, CEO and co-founder of Ably here. Um, we're here to talk about a um, little bit about real time, actually. Um, we're going to go deep on WebSockets, so looking forward to the conversation. So, Matthew, why don't you introduce yourself? Thanks for having me on, James. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm Matt, as you, as you mentioned, I'm co-founder and CEO of Ably. Um, I've been a software engineer pretty much my whole life, um, primarily in the sort of more the web application space. Um, and Ably is, is not my first business. I've been sort of quite entrepreneurial through the past as so my third business Mate, now. You've got gray in your hair. I can already see that. You don't need to... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> it's a, it's a graying path indeed. But, you know. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so it's um, yeah, so I'm onto Ably now. It's it's a really deeply technical business. It's developer first business, and it's actually the first business that where I really feel like connect with with my audience, right? Because I am a developer and I'm selling to developers, and it's and it's fantastic. Yeah, I mean, so developer experience big big focus for us at Red Monk. Um, you know, obviously we've been on this sort of new kingmakers notion for quite a long time. The importance of, I mean, these days we've even got a whole new term for it, haven't we? Like product led growth. Um, it seems to be the thing, which is much more about that developer to developer conversation, developer to developer um, design points for products. So yeah, great, great to have you here. That makes a lot of sense. So I, I do laugh when you mention product led growth. It does make me laugh because you know when when our investors talk to us, um, you know they they'd always describe us as this product led growth business. And mm -hmm. um, I'd love to say you know when we started the business, we were thinking about building a product led growth business, but that term didn't even exist when we were starting the business. And really, what it was we were trying to do is we were developers trying to sell to developers, thinking how do developers want to buy software? How would we want to buy software? And how, you know, what do we want to do? And we didn't want to go and, you know, do sales and, and talk to humans. We wanted to build a product that people can consume. And of course now it's product late growth, which is, uh, it's, it's quite amusing, but, uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice to end up on that side of things. Give it a name, fashion business, uh, <laughs> investors love a thesis. Um, and, and yeah, that's certainly the, the kind of the, the buzzword du jour, as you say, I mean, I think from our perspective, it is much more about that engineering mindset. Yeah, what would developers like? How would they want to engage? Um, I think the funny thing, of course, about product-led growth is as soon as you get successful at it, you're going to be hiring salespeople. I mean, if you look at a company like Sneak um, in, in the security space, sure, it may be going, oh, yes, it's just developers love it. But they are all uh, shiny teeth, big suited, hardcore sales oriented company now. So. Yeah. Um, but at this point, at this point, at least, yeah, focusing on on products that that, that developers like. Um, and so Ably, uh, talk a bit more about specifically what was that? What was that problem? What did you want to solve? What did you feel that developers didn't have? I mean, I think when we started the business, the vision was that um, every consumer will just expect every application they use to be live and in sync. And, um, and you know, I think when we started the business, that was new. That was quite novel. You know, Gmail would sort of just become prolific around, you know, kind of giving you a more real-time experience. Um, you know, today, I think it's, it's completely different, right? There's an instant economy. Just consumers expect everything to be in real time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, what we had set out to do at the time was we looked at, what I was doing is I, was, I, would, I just sold my previous business. I was looking at new startup ideas and they all had a real-time component. Every, every single one of them, the way I thought about differentiating in the market was make it live, make it collaborative. Um, and of course we've seen the successes. We've seen people like Figma, Miro, Google Docs really yep. break into markets that are really well established, but they've kind of embraced live collaborative, you know, intrinsically in their product, which has set them apart and people love it. And so at that time, uh, you know, what there was a, a lot of web technologies that emerged from really from XHR polling and comets and all of these things. And they, they were very suitable for things like delivering notifications. So if you were about building Gmail, you would just send a notification and tell you an email arrived. But if it arrived out of order, if it didn't arrive at all, it wouldn't really matter because you really, it's just notifications. It wasn't critical to the experience. Whereas if you think of something like a Figma or Miro, um, you're editing a document at the same time. And, and, if, and if you don't get an update in the right order, if you don't get an update at all, your documents start to diverge. And what we believed was developers should not have to think about how you make that happen in terms of how you communicate between devices, how you communicate from server to device. If you need to have real-time communication channels between them, um, you should be able to trust that the, 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 the system that you're using, much like TCP IP, no one, no one it's, 
no one checks the TCP IP, the packets getting sent over it are, are working. You trust yeah. that transport to either succeed or fail. Um, and we believe the same, you know, in a real time communication layer, which, you know, under the hood is really just pub sub at, at the core sort of foundational layer. Um, you, you want as a developer to know that either succeeds or fails, but nothing in between. So very much binary. And that was that was the core premise of, of why we built Ava, was give developers that. Of course, what happened is we then realized that everything we do is about real time. And it's about these, for to have a shared live experience, um, we need to have guarantees around also the performance of the communication between each other so that we don't get yeah. an experience that doesn't feel like it's live. And to do that, you know, really the sort of guideline is anything under 100 milliseconds, you'll perceive as real time. So that that kind of forced us, um, forced us into a route where we realized we had to be more like a CDN than a software solution. We had to provide the infrastructure close to where customers are. Okay. Um, and that's kind of why we became an edge service. It wasn't because we set out to be an edge service. We set out to be, an, I mean, built an edge service because that's the only way you can deliver the solution that gives customers this live experience, um, you know, over the APIs that we provide. There's a, there's a couple of things that I really like about that. One is, I mean, obviously we've just over-rotated as a, as a culture on instant gratification. Um, there's just no doubt, I mean, sort of living in, in London or living in the city anyway, we, we, yeah, we're living in a world where the, 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 we're supposed to, I mean, I can walk to the local shop in five minutes and yet I've got a service, not that I use it, but that, you know, the idea that, that I need to be able to get my groceries within five minutes is, I mean, I think that's a mark of this sort of real time, um, uh, sort of world that we're talking about. I think the other thing that I really like, um, if I was an investor, one of the things I'd like to do is like, um, I'd like to invest in companies that are solving solved problems. And when you mention that sort of uh, CDN thing, of course that was, CDN was done. What, you know, Akamai was the solution. Why would we need another thing? Um, and then uh, obviously along come uh, Fastly and Cloudflare, and, and it turns out that there's plenty of room um, for solving solved problems. So PubSub is older than we are, which is quite amazing. <laughs> it takes it up. But, yeah. but, but, but yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> but but, it's, it, it's, it, but, but in, this, in this world, thinking about a solution that developers can use. And so you're coming at it. Uh, let's, let's modernize this PubSub idea. You're talking um, at the moment about, um, you know, we've, we, 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 we've had different ways to articulate this, but serverless stacks is, is part of the way that you're thinking about this. And in particular, you've honed in with your product-led growth story that developers understand in talking about serverless web sockets. So what's a serverless stack? And then we'll go on a bit to serverless web sockets. Yeah, what do you, what do you mean serverless stacks? Um, so serverless stack is, is, is a, is a, is a bit amorphic because we, we don't really amorphous at least because we don't know. Um, I mean, I think everyone is interpreting it slightly differently, but for me, a serverless stack is, is around the services that, that you consume that, that together mean you no longer have to worry about infrastructure and we're okay. getting them, you know, we've now got, I mean, obviously I think CDNs were very smart in that they've evolved into doing the sort of stateless parts, because that's what they've done historically, right? They've they've cached assets. Now they're doing compute, but it's still stateless because they've got this network that was built for very much a stateless um, job. Uh, and they're doing a fantastic job at it and starting to kind of, you know, and, and obviously your Netlifiers and people like that emerging are kind of mm -hmm. building on what CDNs did, but kind of giving you this um, way of running serverless stateless code as well as static sites and things like that. Um, you've got the emergence of now serverless. So the, the, the thing that, didn't exist really until a few years ago was, you know, the stateful part would be the database and that couldn't really be serverless. But of course, now that is, you've got Aurora, you've got uh, FaunaDB, um, you, you know, you've got a whole bunch of cockroach and things like that, which are starting to have these very much serverless offerings. You don't need to think about the capacity you need. Um, but I think the bit that's been missing for us is, um, you know, you've got the stateless bit in the middle, which is a compute. You've got the stateful bit at the back end, which is generally your data database. Um, but then there's also a state fill bit between the client and, and the compute bit, which really real time needs. So if you want to sort of stream updates back to a back to a device, you need to keep a stateful connection to that device. Um, and you know, really where we're starting to find where we're bubbling up as as a really good solution, as, as part of the serverless stack, is is maintaining state between 
the clients in our service and then allowing stateful functions to communicate into the Ably service over a channel and to those devices. So you don't have to change your stacks. You can kind of work in this serverless stateless way um, using stateful services like Ably and the Fauna DBs and, you know, on either side. Okay. So yeah, I mean, I think that there was a brilliant talk um, uh, at, the, at the inaugural um, uh, serverless conf given by a guy called Joe Emerson. And, and he, he gave a talk, which, which was actually pretty damning of Amazon. It turns out that they have filled in some of the areas that he was sort of less sure of. But if we can get that sort of composing applications based on these managed services, where you're like, okay, look, I know that I'm going to use Algolia for text search. You know, I'm going to use pre-render. Um, I'm going to use Cloudinary. It's this sort of single purpose um, uh a uh, very particular tool that a developer is like, okay, this is a great API for doing the job. And so from your perspective, is that is that the sort of the, the world you want to fit in? You want to sort of want to own? Um, is, that, is that the point you want to fill in a hole in this serverless stack? I think I'm going to go back to really my same story, which I mentioned, you know, us, about us being PLG. We, we didn't set out to be serverless or edge. We set out to be, we realized that customers you know, unlike Kafka, let's say, so, you know, you could argue with somewhat similar to Kafka. We're not, um, but, but, you know, there are some similarities, which is under the hood, it's PubSub. Under the hood, you get guaranteed ordering, integrity, all of these sort of things. The big mm -hmm. difference is that, you know, from day one, we designed our system around internet volatility, right? So you don't know at what time customers will arrive for what events and how many are going to arrive. And as a developer, you don't want to think about that problem. And we knew that. So we built a system that meant developers didn't have to think about provisioning capacity and all of those things. Of course, what is that, right? That is, that's serverless, right? That means that the developer doesn't need to do that. So I don't think we set out to be serverless. I think um, mm -hmm. at least in the, sorry, let me rephrase that. I don't think we set out to be part of the serverless ecosystem because I'm not even sure that was really just emerging at the time. We just set out to give a component in the stack that developers would use Absolutely. which wouldn't need well, any provisioning the, 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 the companies i've mentioned didn't yeah. i mean i don't think that they had set out to say you know i don't you know like twilio is it is it serverless i mean i think in, in a lot of respects it is but whether they originally set out to be like we're going to be the messaging uh component for the serverless stack no i yeah. mean you know the, we're doing a little bit of marketing here but also just the the, the way that that that, that the people understand stuff but so tell me a bit about that then, because I think that the Kafka comparison is an interesting one, because I think a lot of people, they hear real time, they go, ah, we're talking about Kafka. Um, they hear a thing about, oh, you're processing events, it's an event-driven architecture, yep, that's Kafka. Um, we've, we've got this system, um, you know, what we, 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 we've got, as I've said, we've been building architectures, PubSub for years. What's, why wouldn't, why wouldn't I just use Kafka when it is an industry standard, well, I mean, apart from the fact, um, well, I'll, I'll let you answer the question. <laughs> why, why, why wouldn't I just use? Why wouldn't I just use Kafka? What, what do I need Ably for? So, I mean, there's some fundamental difference. I think let me maybe talk about the things that are, are similar to Kafka. You know, we um, we have very similar semantics, so we we're often used in you know alongside Kafka. Um, so when I say semantics, we have things like guaranteed ordering, support for item potency, um, you know, high throughputs of messages, uh, you know, all of those sort of things um, are, are uh, you know, guaranteed, you know, so the integrity of that whole stream, you get similar semantics. So in that regard, we're similar and it's PubSub. I think where it fundamentally is, is different is the Kafka model is designed around a, effectively a relatively low number of topics. Um, whereas in the internet space, it's very common to have a topic per customer um, because, you know, what you need to do is communicate a notification to that user or a message that someone sent or a particular bit of data that's for them. You need some way of communicating to that, that user. The idea of sort of dynamic topics coming and going as users come and go in Kafka is just fundamentally not the way it's been designed. It's designed that you provision your topics. They exist yep. and then you deprovision them. Um, you know, with us, it's all about dynamic provisioning. There is no pre-provisioning of anything. Everything's provisioned just in time so that you have that capacity when you need it. Um, and you know, I think the you know the, the other key things is that Kafka really isn't designed as an internet, it's not meant to be internet facing. Um, it is internet facing when you're kind of exchanging data with other Kafka consumers and producers, but it's not meant to be internet facing to devices. So, you know, a very common thing for something like let's say we do the Australia Open event. Um, okay. You know, we do that every year. We've been doing it for a few years now. 
Um, they compared us against a bunch of other solutions. And, and what they were looking for was, you know, which systems can cope with volatility, you know, millions of users arriving in a very short amount of time. And that's exactly what happens. You get to the final, no one really cares about the final until the last five minutes of the final, then everyone comes in that time. And, you know, the way we designed Ably is that we can double the capacity. I think it's around every two minutes, you can double the capacity in the system. Now, Kafka, you know, we use Cassandra under the hood and things like that. These are systems that, that you have to, to kind of add capacity, you have to migrate state and that state's on disk. Um, so it's very slow to kind of increase capacity and very slow to decrease capacity. So it's, you know, fundamentally- and when um, QDOS is having a meltdown and everyone's like, we've got to see this. You're the, you're the underpinning of the Australia. Sorry, I'm just, just thinking about that, that thing that generates, a, oh, what's he doing now? Let's go, you know, suddenly everyone has to, as I say, the final or, uh, and it was so, <laughs> I was just thinking about the idea of a meltdown and, uh, and, and Kyrgios was, was the human uh, example of a thing that could suddenly be like, wait, what's, 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 what's happening now at the Australian Open? Yeah. I mean, there were some horror stories in the early days. We, you know, just tremendous load arriving in, you know, tiny amounts of time. There was a, we had a customer over in the US. So it was probably our first big customer. They used to send an email out every Saturday morning with an offer to everyone all at the same time. And everyone would arrive all at the same time. Um, and, you know, this is the very early days before we really learned how to deal with scale. And everything would just fall over for the first five minutes. And I mean, it was, it was incredible. And it's taken us a long time to learn how to really respond to incredibly volatile events. Um, mm -hmm. And that's the, that's the sort of fundamentally the difference. You know, we, you know, Kafka doesn't use WebSockets. It's got its own protocol. It's designed for server-to-server -server communication. It, you know, it's designed for very high throughput. Um, with Ably, actually, it's quite different. The system itself is designed for very high throughput, but the client communication is not high throughput. I mean, a mobile device does not need high throughput. If anything, if you're sending high throughput, you've got a problem there because you're probably sending right. too much data to that mobile device. So it's the, the number um, of connections rather than the throughput of the connection. Exactly. And, and so we, you know, we always think about it. The overall throughput of the system is, is incredible. We can get to internet scale, but individually, each person, each device, is relatively low throughput compared to something like a Kafka connection. Okay, so you're you're and you, as you say, you're you're often used in conjunction um, with Kafka and some of these 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 customer architectures, um, where the Ably is 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 client facing. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a Kafka connector. So you often find data streams through Ably from a device. I don't know. We you know we have a um, we recently we had like a HQ trivia app built on top of Ably where they'd have you know, a few hundred thousand people send their responses um, that needs to get to their Kafka cluster in less than 10 seconds, because that's the time frame you have to respond. They then process it in Kafka and then broadcast all the changes back through Kafka into Ably and out to those devices. Um, that's that's quite sort of common type use case. I mean, I think the, the thing really to bear in mind, which I didn't really mention fundamentally, you know, which sets us differently from Kafka is, you know, we built PubSub as the, as the sort of primitive that we build APIs on top of. So, you know, if a customer wants to show who's online, um, you know, like right now we're on this together, I can see you're online, I can see some information around you. That's that's effectively a presence API. That that presence API is built on top of PubSub. Our developers who use our SDKs, they don't, they don't, they're not exposed to PubSub. They exposed to a presence API, which tells them people entering or yeah. leaving and who's present. And so really, you know, our, our vision was build this very scalable primitive that gives you know that right now it's reaching about 300 million people a month in terms of the reach um have that primitive and then build apis that solve the problems that developers are trying to implement around live and that's got to be the thing i mean if there is a big difference developer experience because like kafka at the end of the day there's there's there are many thorny problems um associated with that as you say you want to build on the primitive and re really create something is is built for developers um, and so tell me, I mean, I, I think that, 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 that one of the, 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 the triggers there and thinking about this, we, we, you know, we, when, we, when we look at, at modern developers, WebSockets is definitely something, um, I mean, there are basically the, what you've been saying makes me sort of question two things. One is, you know, absolutely, you know, let's talk about WebSockets. But then I want to talk a bit about more the um, uh, primitives versus APIs and the kind of build versus buy like what should we be building so first of all yeah let's let's talk a bit about websockets and where that fits in and, and and i mean when that came along 
that must have been like a bit of a a, a sort of a um what's the word but a, a great moment for you because it's like yeah yeah this really maps to this maps to the problem we're solving and it brings a set of developers with it I mean, yeah, web, web sockets is the magic that makes this work. I mean, you know, you'll, you'll probably be aware there's there's new transports emerging, things like web transport. They It's not widely adopted yet. Um, you know, our belief is that because developers are using our APIs, you know, we can in the future, you know, opaquely swap out and use better transports when they're available. But right now they're not, um, at least not mm -hmm. widely spread. So, but web transport, I mean, so web sockets was really the big enabler in terms of if you need bi-directional communication and needs to be low latency with little overhead, um, you know, WebSockets enabled that. And it was a big shift in the industry. And I think, um, you know, we have to support, we still support um, ACTP because, you know, um, you know, we just had a, a big customer come on board recently who still has data centers sitting in, you know, behind restrictive firewalls that block WebSocket. I mean, it's unbelievable, yeah. but it still happens today. Um, so we have to, we have to have fallback transport. So you could, you could argue that um, WebSockets wasn't the thing that made it happen. It was more Comet. I think Comet was the enabler. But WebSockets is what made it mature and, and, and really created a transport design to solve this problem. Um, and, and, and absolutely for us is being the thing that we built the business around. That, that, that transport is the enabling layer um, for people to build these sort of rich, live, collaborative experiences. Okay, cool. So build versus buy, because I think that the, this, or even primitives versus APIs. So, uh, you know, it's very interesting. Um, we had a... Um, yeah, my my colleague Stephen O'Grady, he he's he's a very level person. He gets excited maybe, you know, twice in his life. If if the Red Sox, you know, win the World Series, uh, you know, maybe getting married, the birth of, 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 of his daughter, that's about it. You know, he doesn't get very excited. He doesn't get very happy, but he doesn't get very unhappy either. He's a very, very sort of level person. Um, but but he 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 got a little bit frisky at the last reinvent when you know, I think that we've been looking at this world of developer experience and really focusing on perhaps something that's a bit more opinionated, something that really you know, understands the developer workflow, that tries to make that easier for them, make some decisions on their behalf, um, that, 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 you know, um, has an abstraction level that, 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 that suits perhaps uh, their way of working rather than it just being a world of primitives. And, you know, we were sort of expecting there might be something a little bit more pass like and we were kind of looking at the opportunities of of Amplify and where Amazon's taking that. And then Werner comes on and he's like, primitives, we build primitives because you ask for them, you know, you want them. So everything's the world of primitives. And I think Steve did write a slightly salty blog post after that. So I think this, the, 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 some of these things we could build from primitives. Um, and, and yeah, I think that that's one of the questions for me. Like I could go and use some Amazon services to do some of the things that I could do with Ably. Why, why should I use Ably? Uh, what's the, what's the advantage there? What, what should I build? What should I buy? What are you going to, what are the jobs to be done that you're really solving with developers that they're like, hang on a minute, I've really just got to use Ably. You know, I shouldn't be in the, in the business of, of, of building this myself. You know, it's, um, I mean, I, I think AWS has done a fantastic job of building primitives, and they're all good primitives. They're not they're not the best primitives, but they're all good. Um, and that's, I think, their mainstay. You've got a bunch of really good primitives that you can glue together and do amazing things. Um, and then you would argue, exactly, why does Ably exist? Because you've got all these primitives. And, you know, from experience, it's, um, you know, our biggest challenge, our biggest competitor, whenever investors or anyone has asked us, you know, who's your biggest competitor? I'm like, our biggest competitor is the fact that a developer, you know, their first need is I need to make this text field update in real time. Um, well, WebSockets, I know WebSockets, that's not difficult. My framework supports WebSockets, so that can't be hard, so I'll do that. And and that's the first step towards this never-ending world of technical debt around edge cases, new requirements, new problems that you didn't think of. So, you know, you start with something like, I just need to, you know, stream the thing, stream that that price information, and then suddenly someone says, hold on, this person in this environment's not working. So you think, oh, I need to support ACTP. And then you discover that you haven't got a reconnection strategy. And then you've got a thundering herd problem when, you know, many thousands of people disconnect and reconnect at the same time because your firewall, I don't know, your load balancer reconfigured. 
Um, mm -hmm. And it just kind of, it just keeps going and you just keep discovering more and more of these problems. And, you know, I think what we found is we have a, a lot of customers who move across from either these open source solutions they're hosting or, you know, plugging together five or six different primitives in Amazon um, because they discover that, you know, you know they're not, the, the primitives, they're still having to glue the primitives together to build business logic. They have to worry about authentication. They have to worry about scaling, provisioning. Like, how do they deal with multi-region multi regions when suddenly all your users are in Australia and they're connecting to the US? And it's just this minefield of 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 pain that you're going to go through. And um, and so I think, you know, fundamentally what we've done is we've just been doing this a long time and understanding what is it that is needed to, for developers to deliver live shared experiences. Um, and, you know, in our SDKs, when we first started, I think we thought we had over-engineered them. And we've come to learn that I don't think we have. Like, we thought about every edge case that can happen. Like, you know, when a, a particular region goes down, the client itself doesn't wait for DNS to update because that could take two minutes. Um, mm -hmm. It will go and find an alternative data center within seconds so that you get continuity of service. Now, that's fundamentally different between, you know, suddenly one region and, you know, we, we often see these AWS regions go down. I mean, for us now, it's... It's not even it's not even a surprise. It's just a routine thing. The region goes Absolutely. down, route traffic away, keep running. Um, you know, we've just got all of this wealth of experience of all these things we didn't expect that we didn't expect. <laughs> you know, we didn't expect over the last five, six, seven years of running things in production, learning what can happen and how to kind of mitigate that. And so really it's that's what that's why we exist. It's because we've we've laser focused on one thing. And you know, I remember when when I was talking to I think it was Insight um, in our last funding round. And what was interesting is, you know, in every funding round before, every investor had said to us, what are you going to do if AWS does what you do? Um, mm -hmm. And I kind of always sort of chuckled a bit because, you know, you could argue, what are you going to do if, a if, a if, a if Amazon decides they're going to open a VC and target the same yeah, area I mean, as you, Amazon, right? I mean, you could be <laughs> Amazon, no fun. Sure, yeah, great question for the VCs, no doubt. <laughs> but, you know, what, what Insight said, which is really fascinating, is that, you know, Amazon recognized that they operate in primitives and they will capture and the cloud space with these primitives will take about 50% of the market. Um, and then you've got these market leaders who realize it's not about a primitive. It's about more of an opinionated um, mm -hmm. service that solves a wider set of problems that'll take about 25% of the market. The market, one market leader will take about 25% and then the rest scrap over the last 25%. And, you know, their belief was, well, Abley's going to be that market leader and take that 25%. So you were um, very, you know, Amazon very will happy still take 50%. You, yeah, sorry. When you had that conversation with Insight, you were like, oh, finally, somebody that gets me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I know. But I think there's something to be said about it. You know, the Vercells and the Netlify's, I mean, the road <laughs> came along before, and now got uh, Railway and people like that. It, these opinionated, I mean, you know, even um, Ruby on Rails. Ruby on Rails just changed the world and said, you know, stop solving so problems over and over. Be opinionated, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and I think infrastructure has become opinionated and think services have become opinionated. And the reality is it's our job to look ahead and think about what are the problems you need to solve and make sure we have APIs for them. But we solve that in an opinionated way. And I, I think that's- a video the series called Opinionated Infrastructure. And honestly, I think I should bring it back. I was too early. I was too early. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so the, the, I think we got it. We got it. Understand where you're coming from. Um, understand where you're going. Apparently, you're going to take 25% of this market and Amazon have the other 50%. Yeah. So uh, you'll be buying the drinks if we ever get to sit down um, in person. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I've just got to say, Matthew, it's been a real pleasure today. I think that um, our, our, our viewers um, you know, will we'll have a, a, a good sense of what you do. Um, if anyone's got any questions, uh, Matthew is, is is you know easy to find. You know he's he's there. You're there on Twitter, right? I am Matthew Ridden. Yeah, without the apostrophe. There you go, Matthew Ridden. So like you know, go and go and uh, yeah, apostrophes. The internet computers do not handle apostrophes very well. Sequel um, injections still to this day with my name. <laughs> yeah, well, Stephen O'Grady, he has all sorts of uh, issues of his own. But yeah, uh, the. Uh, the yeah. computers are not designed for Irish people, Irish names. Um, but but yeah, uh, Matt is out there. But also comment, uh, you know, on 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 this video. I'll yeah. let him know. Uh, subscribe, all of that good stuff. Uh, Matthew, it's been a real pleasure. Great to learn a bit more about Abley. And uh, yeah, we'll talk again. Uh, thanks very much. Brilliant. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure.